So it's good to see everybody. Um, you can see on the screen, there's uh, Mr. Chiu Xiaolong, our author of the day. Um, and he's had many books, we'll come to him in a second, but I just wanna say hi to all the new friends, old friends. Was Zhang Mei, I'm Zhang Mei. And this is our 94th event <laughs> since the pandemic started. Um, and, but it's the first event I'm actually hosting from inside China. Uh, in beautiful old town of Dali. I can see Erhai Lake in the distance and Tangshan Mountain on the other side. It's, it's quite beautiful here. And I hope the quarantine ends soon so all of you can come back and visit. Um, as many of you know, we organize a monthly book club and each month we read a book on the China, around the China theme. And so this month, uh, I'm delighted to introduce to you Mr. Chiu Xiaolong. And we read his book, not no longer the newest, as I just heard. Um, Xiaolong just received a new copy of his latest book. But this one we read is called Inspector Chen and the Private Kitchen Murder. I have to share with you, I read this book. This book is based in Shanghai. And I read it when I was in my two week quarantine in a hotel in Shanghai. So I kept looking out the window and then, am I gonna witness a murder? <laughs> and <laughs> wanting to go out and explore the city. The city just sets, sets such a beautiful scene of Shanghai. And a few words on uh, Mr. Cho, hang on. Am I back? Okay. Yes, yes. All right. Uh, a few words on Mr. Cho. Uh, he's a crime novelist, quite a Renaissance man, and also English language poet, a translator, a critic, um, and he's originally from Shanghai. That's why this book reads so much like, so intimate. It's someone from someone who really knows the city. Uh, but Xiaolong currently lives in St. Louis, Missouri. And his first book, Death of a Red Herring, won an Anthony's first best first book award and a few others. And his books always incorporate so many little sort of cultural elements of China in, in the story. They both sort of set the scene really nicely, but also gives us a lens into, I would say, everyday life in China. And I love this um, a blend of food, architecture, politics, natural scenery, um, even love affairs, <laughs> human relationships. And it's just really, really, I, I find it really wonderful to explore this country through uh, Xiaolong's words. Now, I know um, Xiaolong has prepared a brief um, talk introduction about himself and Inspector Chen. So I'll hand things over. I will come back with um, some questions. I have a few, and if any of you have read the book or want to know about the book, uh, have questions ready, we'll get to them shortly. Now, let me hand the room over to you, Xiaolong. Thank you, thank you for taking the time. Thank you, Fang Mei, and uh, thank you for all the people you know, attending the event tonight. It's always a pleasure for an author to talk to his reader. And uh, that's what make you know, the, the writing worthwhile. But to read it does. Now, just a few words about myself and about my writing of the inspection series. I did not set out to write a mystery book, no. I got my, I went to United States in 1988 as a Ford Foundation family. And then, you know, for one reason or another, I stayed on and studied for a degree. I got my PhD in comparative literature and I started teaching, but I did not go back to China until eight years later, after you know, mm. 1988. So first time when I was back, I was really surprised, amazed by you know, things happened in China. So I thought, okay, I would write something about a change in China. 
So it's originally it's a novel about you know the Chinese society in transition. But I I wrote poetry. Uh, I translate, but I did not write English novel before. So that mm -hmm. is why I had very difficult time you know, putting my material together. So that is why I thought, okay, maybe I can try because I love mystery. I can use a genre as a framework for what I want to say, right? Because as a mystery, you always have a case, you always have a body at the beginning, <laughs> and then you always have to investigate, and then you always have to conclude, of course, the suspense all the time. But I did not really know whether I'm writing a mystery or not, because I never wrote one before. Mm. But in the middle of the writing process, I found Mystery is really a convenient tool, you know, for my purpose, because if you want to write about the society, right, about social problems, a cop can be a very convenient tool. He walks around the city, knock on people's door, right, raise all kinds of questions, and sometimes has some inside information as well, because, you know, the position in China. So, I finished the first book, that's a red hero, because uh, the main character name is Hong Ying, the Chinese name Hong Ying. So that is why it's a lucky coincidence, right? It's red hero. It's and I finished the first book, I give that to the publisher. And my publisher, to my surprise, said, Well, it's a good mystery. We want to sign in a contract with you for three books instead of one. I did not have a con, I did not have an agent. So I was really flattered, right? Wow, without agent, I, I secure like three books. And that's how that's how I started. Okay. I started. And uh, but after I signed the contract, I realized I got into trouble because you have to write book one, book two, book three, right? Right now, I think it's book number three, uh, 13 or 14. So not mention other books I've been writing because the publisher all behind you. Okay, you have to, you know, the deadline, right? You have to. Now, maybe because my original, you know, intention, I never set out to write just like a mystery or the who done it, right? The term who done it is just because for me it's not enough to just write a book about the who killed who. I want to explore in what kind of sociological, political, cultural, and of course political circumstance the crime take place and also the investigation take place. For me, it's also more rewarding. I, I, I don't like you know, this kind of mystery, like the murderer or the criminal is like a bomb evil, right? You have to understand why you know, he becomes such evil, or for that matter, why he's a really a good guy, right? To fighting for justice. You know, I need. So I think in that sense, you can also say I came under the influence of the soci sociological school of mystery, especially in the European, you know, there's a group, Swedish authors, a group of European writers. They no longer write, you know, just like Sherlock Holmes or Agatha Christie. They write, you know, in what kind of social background the crime take place. So, so I come under their influence. And that's also why in each and every book of my mystery, I put the case in a very specific background. Like, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I gave a talk to BBC about one of my Inspector Chen novel, 
The title is Hold Your Breath, China. And I think you can guess, right? It's about air pollution in China. So it's a murder mystery, yes. But at the same time, it's also about air pollution, the environmental crisis. And like, you know, for this book, it's a mystery. It's about a kind of fashionable, a mystery happening in a fashionable Shanghai restaurant. It's called a Su Bang Cai. It's actually, it's no longer, you know, it's a restaurant, right? It's like in a very fancy dining place or like a club, right? And very expensive. And, uh, but for me, of course it is a mystery, but for me, it's, it's certainly not enough. It's just a mystery. Like in this book, what I have in mind, or you can say the superstructure, you know, I have in mind for this book is really concerning, concerning the judicial system in China. Right? You know, we many years ago. I read a poem by W. H. Auden. It's 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 wonderful poem, but it's also a funny poem. It says, "The law is like the sun. The law is like the garden. The law is like love. You know, the law the law can be like anything. Okay, but how about things in China, right? And also in China, in China." You know, we all talk about everything is under the leadership of the party, right? What about law? And of course, this inspection in this book, he already got into trouble. Because that's, that's also a question, you know. Uh, a Shanghai journalist friend asked me, he says, how can be your inspection an idealistic bookshman solve one case after another without getting into trouble? <laughs> and it, it, it is a good question, right? So in this book, he's already in trouble, in big trouble. He's no longer chief inspector in Shanghai Police Bureau. Even though he still has a position, but that's position without the real power. And he is also barred from doing investigation like before. And imagine he's an idealistic and a bookshman. He still wants to you know, do the investigation in the proper way, right? For justice. It's, it's very difficult for him, very difficult. So what can he do? So he need to have a cover for his investigation. He need tell the people above him, no, 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 I'm, I'm no longer doing any work as a cop. I'm writing a book about a Dong Dynasty judge. And we probably know it's a famous Judge D, right? The first Judge D book was written by a Dutch Sinologist Van Gulik is quite famous. And even today in China, we have a lot of Judge D movie, TV movie, and the books as well. Okay. And also, in using that as a cover for his investigation, he's also doing some thinking about you know, the judicial system, how that works in Asian China and in the present day China as well. And it's very interesting because in English, we always say the Judge D investigation, right? But if you really want to do that, to do close reading, you will find that's, that's a wrong translation. DLNG in real Chinese history was a big official, not a judge. 
not a judge. Even though in his long official career, he has occasionally, okay, done some cases, but he's not judge. So that in itself shows, you know, there's not such a clear separation between the executive and the judicial power of the government. No, you have to be the, like Judge D. At one time he was a prime minister. That was why he could make the difference because he had the power, right? He had the power. So anyway, back to this book, back to this book. The case happened in the present day China. It's about, you know, I won't go into details now because some of you may not have read it, right? So I won't go into detail. But it's a case that puzzle inspection because the murderer does not have a motive. Okay. She is quite wealthy, quite well known, and a beautiful. But according you know, to the, according to some other people, you know, who are doing the case, she killed a maid in her household. There's no reason, right? You know, when we talk about like you know a murder case, you all must have a motive, you know. Why? They are not on the same level. One is like, you know, a quite wealthy, fashionable, an iconic character. One is just like a you know, poor girl, like, you know, from the countryside. What's, why? Why she want to kill that? And also in doing that, it happens, it happens. She finds something similar in the Judge D. case she's writing. Because this, judge, this particular Judge D. case, I just got a book yesterday, also is based on the real Tang Dynasty murder case. And it's based on real Tang Dynasty poets, Yu Xuanji, a very well-known Yu Shilin. And her case is also this kind of bizarre. She also beat a maid to death. And nobody understands why. She's a well-known, a poetess, and talented, beautiful. But why should I kill? Right? And then you know the, 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 the body was discovered the next day. So there's something similar in the two cases. So my intention was, original intention was, it's like you know, to let the two cases comment to each other. But originally, my design was just to write one book, not two books. The Yu Xuanji case, the Dan Dynasty case, it's going to be just like a novella or maybe a short story, an appendix. But my publisher really likes ideas. No, 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 we have to have two books. Of course, maybe the two novels make more money for them, right? But they, they just like the idea. So no, we have to have two books. So that is why now you have two. You have two. You know? yeah. The two book kind of comments each other. And the paradox is like, you know, yes, China changes. But the other sense, China does not change, right? You still have in a lot of like in the irony in history, you know, working between the two, working between the two. So it's for me, it's you know, as I mentioned earlier, it's always I feel more rewarding to to write this kind of mystery uh, in this kind of specific social background. For me, it's really more like you know, rewarding. Almost each and every of my inspection books, uh, I got something like you know, uh, one book is called 
red mandarin dress, Hong Shi Pao. I talked about you know, the aftermath of the Cultural Revolution, even though this is not topic. People do not want to talk too much in China, right? But I, I put that, you know, you have to acknowledge that. You have to acknowledge that. And in another inspection novel, Don't Cry Thai Lake, it's about, you know, the water pollution, right? And in, in Shanghai Redemption, it's about corruption, you know, in, in China. So it's each and every one book I choose, you know, uh, a specific, specific superstructure, if you want to call that, or like, you know, circumstance background the novel. And I just want to mention one thing more. Uh, mm. You know, before your wild China you know, enterprise, uh, there was a German tourist company. They also organized, you know, this kind of event. They even have like, you know, a title for the inspection to China. Because in, in my books, the restaurant, uh, the theaters, the hotels, most of them are real, are real. So some reader really, I think both Italian and uh, German tourist company have organized events like this for several times, several times. And, uh, but there's, except there's one small problem is that, you know, some of my book were translated into Chinese as well. Okay. And, but, but some of my, you know, readers like, you know, with a Chinese book want to find, you know, which restaurant in Spechen, like, you know, <laughs> or which hotel he stayed. And they said, no, we cannot find it because <laughs> My Chinese publisher changed all the names. Yeah, they, they even do not say this case happens in Shanghai. No, they say, they say in H cities, oh. they use English letter H. Oh. Yeah, and for that reason, they say, okay, it's, if I say, uh, for example, Wai Tai, right? We all know. <laughs> Wai Tai Shanghai. And I, in English, of course, I use Bob because I'm writing the book in English. And then in Chinese translation, somebody else translate that. They say Riverside. <laughs> they don't say Wai Tai. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the logic is, you know, this kind of uh, criminal case can happen in a fictional city. I think maybe that's their logic, okay? Can happen in fictional city, but not in real city. So what can you say? <laughs> but don't follow, okay? My warning, don't follow this Chinese book if you want to find the name of that restaurant or that you know, hotel, no, because it's, they change all these names as well. Hmm. Because they're worried if they don't change the name, they can't, the reader can still recognize, right? This is in Shanghai. But there's just one more funny, I, I think that's, that's that I, I would stop talking. One more no, funny thing right. is, after you know, this book published, you know, the Chinese translation come out, some review come out. And the review mentions Chu Xiaolong's book about Shanghai. So I, I was puzzled. So I asked my Chinese you know, publisher, why in the review, you know, can't say it's Shanghai, right? The book cannot say, they said, well, maybe people don't pay too much attention to review, so that's okay. <laughs> you know, some people, right? You know. Yeah, this, it's fantastic. It, it's kind of, you know. It's funny. 
It's funny, yeah, yeah. It's funny. No, in one sense, I think I'm lucky as a Chinese writer writing about China. I I I don't have to worry about like the you know, rights block. So many things happen in China today. <laughs> you just pick up, right? You can write it in your book. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's great. But as you were speaking, I, I was already like bringing on all these questions. Uh, what you just said, I mean, so many things are happening in China, murder mysteries, you know, all sorts of things. Where, yeah. where do you get all these inspiration? Like where, where do you pick up the initial seed of the plot? Like the murder, is it a case you read in the newspaper or where does the seed come from? You know, one time I wrote a small piece opinion page in the York Times, and my title is, you know, the 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 the, react, the, China, the reality in Chinese society is, is stranger than in my fiction. Yeah, I, I don't have to make up, you know, like the like the whole deal brass China, you know, the the one I the, the novel I give a talk at the BBC. If you like, you know, happen to be in China, like you know, maybe seven, eight years ago, you must be familiar with the documentary made by Tai Jing under the dome, right? Mm, yeah. Yeah. So the material is there. Of course, I have to fictionalize, you know, what's happening in China. Like, you know, this this documentary in three days was viewed by 30 million times, right? Mm, yeah. Amazing, amazing. But then it suddenly stopped all the time. And this documentary was founded by a person, or not just a person, maybe a group of people, but not by government. But why? You know, this kind of thing, you don't have to add up anything. It's there. It's there. Mm. And also, like in the Shanghai Redemption, it's more or less like like you know got the some plot you know from you know bosch like case that's so weird right the case itself it's 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 even more bizarre than a real murder case right some people need to add more like for the mystery but in my case sometimes i have to get the less because people won't believe you know this kind of thing could happen what happened? Hmm. That, yeah, that actually takes me, I'm gonna take one of our audience questions here to perfect follow up on that. Anthony Fregola, who's a longtime uh, reader of yours, he's uh -huh. Chen series, and also a longtime participant in our online events. He said, since you no longer live in China, how do you actually, keep current with, with, you know, the current events and also the, how the government operates. Um, is it reading WeChat articles <laughs> yeah. or do you travel frequently? How, how do you stay on top? Uh, for one thing, I do travel frequently back to China. Okay. Uh, like for the last 10 years, I would say before the pandemic, before the pandemic, I travel back at least once, twice, sometimes three times a year. Okay. Yeah, yeah. because I, I did you know, do research online and you know, but that's different. Like, you know, to in real contact, you know, with real people make, make yeah. a lot of difference for me. Yeah. But on the other hand, you know, I, it's also, you know, the, the same journalist asked me a question about how, you know, inspect Chen can not get into trouble. He, he said to me, he said, you know, in a way, he said, you're in a, talking about me, you're in a better way to write, you know, crime novels about China, better than Chinese, right? I said, why? Why is he that, right? I was a little bit, you know, surprised when he, he said that to me. He said, you know, when we want to do some research, especially we now the people do a lot of research online, right? Instead of just mm -hmm. the library. Mm -hmm. 
We can't. A lot of websites, you know, you cannot have access to that. Unless you can climb over the wall, right? <laughs> we know what it is, yeah? yeah. But, but I can do all the research I want without having to worry about that. Mm. And nowadays, it's really, really like, you know, convenient and easy if you want, you know, to, to do this kind of research. Mm. And another thing I think, you know, it's, it's also in a similar question, I also mentioned that, yes. You know, in one sense, I, I do think, you know, compared to the Chinese writer living in China all the time, right? I do have the disadvantage, like I may not be as familiar as they are, you know, with uh, real things in China. But on the other hand, maybe I have my advantage as well. Because mm. it's like in, in Supong Bo's poem. If you are in the mountains, you may not be able to have a real picture of the Lu Mountain, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Things in China can be really complicated. So I think sometimes, you know, I kind of enjoy myself as both an inside and outside. I need mm. a distance because I need to think. Usually I don't try to rush to write something happening in China right now. I, I would like to wait like one or two years, right? I need to think, I need that kind of distance, but it may also help. Maybe more objective, maybe, you know, Sometimes if you yourself getting too involved in, in something directly, you may not see the picture too clearly. So I try to keep something like a balance. You know? Yes, I need to keep myself in close contact as much as possible, but at the yeah. same time, you know, some distance, some distance. I can I can absolutely relate. There is the frequent traveling sort of keeps you in touch with the roots. Yes. I've read some other uh, books written by Chinese authors living overseas. Mm -hmm. if, if, if there isn't a frequent back and forth traveling, there can be a disconnect between uh, the China in their memory and the China that's happening today. So it seems like there's a time warp. You know, they only see China and think of the Chinese mentality of how everyone you know, goes overseas and want to stay overseas, that sort of mentality of the 1990s or 80s. Uh -huh. um, and when you read that, you feel like, oh, the author hasn't been back um, to China for a while. Yeah. You're right, you're right. That's one thing I try to do is like, you know, you know, there are a lot of good writings about, you know, the, Cultural revolution, you know, or like before that, but not too many people are writing about what's happened in China today, right? Mm. Mm. So maybe that's something I can do. Mm. Maybe something that's, some, that's something I can do because I go back there quite frequently. Yeah. And because I'm still teaching there, right? So it's kind of, you know, both inside and outside. Yeah. 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 Um, you actually touched on one of Kendra's key questions. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just read you the question if you have anything to add. She said, do you find living in the U.S. makes it easier for you to notice and appreciate the little things um, when you travel back or just in memory? The, the distance, like some of these, for example, the, the opening scene in the marriage market in one of the parks in oh, Shanghai. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Right? Actually, why don't you go ahead and, and set the scene for some of our readers? It, it, it's, 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 it's charming. I find it really charming. Mm -hmm. um, but 
I would say for someone living in China, this is like every day, you don't really see it. Um, why don't you set the scene for us and, and talk a little bit about that? Exactly, exactly. Actually, before that, uh -huh. uh, I, I wrote about this kind of thing in the first novel you know, of the inspection series. Okay. I, I wrote, because inspection is kind of a bookshman, love poetry, right? Mm -hmm. And so I have him walk in the, in the bomb park, bomb park, you know, one day and I see a young girl reading a book and he's he kind of, you know, bookish again. He said, oh, this young girl must be reading a poetry book, right? Or reading English <laughs> as he did, you know, many years ago. Mm -hmm. It turned out, the young girl was reading a book about how to make money in the stock market. <laughs> so, yeah. so he was really disappointed. And I, I said that, you know, to my fellow Chinese writer. And they kind of laughed at me. You saw Zheng Duo Guai because you, you saw so little. That's why you wonder, yeah. right? Saw Zheng Duo Guai. And uh, the same thing about, you know, like you, you really have a good point. The same thing as you mentioned about, you know, the marriage, you know, market, right? In people, it's real, it's real. Yeah. I, I, I was there, you know, take a look at myself. Several rocks, actually. <laughs> I, I, I ask people, matching corner, they call that, okay? Mm -hmm. How, you know, this, yeah, it's so normal because, you know, nowadays it's really, you know, uh, materialistic society, right? People mm -hmm. have to take into consideration all these kind of real things, rooms, you know, cars, you know, money. And it's, it's just like, you know, the skill, right? Have to be, every materialistic have to, but for me, when I first, some people told me, actually it's a French friend. He's a journalist. He told me, oh, I, I was at People's Park. You know, I was really surprised. I said, really? So I, I went there myself and I was surprised too. But when I talked to my Shanghai friend, they just take for granted. Maybe they went there themselves as well for their children. Yeah. So that's you know, another example of this kind of perspective, right? For me, it's a perspective. I'm I'm not totally like inside. I have an outside perspective there. That's why I found you know, that's something. It's not something my invention, but it's. Mm. But I cannot make it up, right? Like yeah. where, where I in the eighties, I wrote poems, quite a number of poems in Chinese. I never would imagine this, this kind of matching corner <laughs> would appear one day in Shanghai, right? <laughs> you will find, you know, a wife or husband just because the wife, you know, uh, or the husband, you know, makes money, <laughs> like, you know, has a car, you know, this kind of thing you would never, never, you know. In recently, I even in a short Chinese article. Sometimes I still write short Chinese article. Okay. As well, I said, you know, mm -hmm. I was really surprised. Like in nowadays, we have Chinese new term called a yan zhi. Maybe <laughs> that's ridiculous. It's like you know the face value or look value, right? It's like yeah. in a person we say beautiful, okay, pretty, that's it, right? It's subject. Mm. And now it's like, you know, your beauty is like worth so much money. It's, yeah, yeah. You know, the language itself changed. It's just got so materialistic. You know, in that sense, you can, you can say it's like postmodernism. It's the language speaks to people not the people speak the language. And that is why we have to write, right? Otherwise, you know, we just like this kind of language speak us. Yeah. 
Um, one of, I, 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 as you're speaking, I'm just relating to it. It's been two years since I traveled back to China. Uh -huh. and, and before that, I was like you, very frequent as well. Probably mm -hmm. um, every other month I was back in China. But not being here for two years, you notice a complete change, not, not complete, but like addition of vocabularies that I never knew before. Yes. Uh, yes. And there are, there are two of them that I heard a lot, which I thought is very funny. Nature, all the Nature. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone talks about it. Another one is Guoju, and then the Shanghai Ren Zong Shi, the Shanghai people always use their hands and say, Guoju Gao, Guoju uh -huh. Di. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> you probably are very familiar with this type of change. Maybe you can explain to our audience a little bit. <laughs> these language changes that are it's reflecting. Not just that. It's, it's, you know, the society changed too, right? Mm. People's mind changed that too. Mm. You know, there's a linguistic theory about that. Because the language the people speak is like, has inner structure that makes way makes people to see the people in a specific way so if you speak this kind of language all the time and time then you see this world in this kind of light as well instead of like real value right you just talk about mm -hmm. the materialistic value mm. like nowadays like I talk to, sometimes I still talk to my Shanghai friend about poetry. But I say, what's the point <laughs> writing poetry, <laughs> right? Mm. That's, that's, and uh, whoops, are we there? Yeah. Okay, yeah. but that's, that's interesting. So how do your contemporaries, your old friends from Shanghai view your success in the English literary world in, in the West? Uh, honestly, not too many people think it's success <laughs> because they don't think they make, you make a lot of money, okay? That's <laughs> because right. nowadays that definition of success is money. Like, you know, I can say here, I consider myself lucky. I do things I want to do, right? And I make money for it. At least the money, money enough, you know, for me to, to live here, okay? I don't have to like, you know, to worry about other things. Mm. But to my Chinese, some, okay, some of my Chinese friends, that's not enough. If you Why, look at, if you read some in the Chinese online literature, they talk about all the like you know well-known brand um, American cars. I have never know, let alone I drive this kind of. So when I, they ask question to me about have you ever driven like you know something like a Maserati or something, no, I never know this kind of car. <laughs> but then in their, like, you know, definition, you are not success. Yours is not success. You just, you just survive. That's it. Huh. Yeah. 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 And, and to that standard, yes, I am not, you know, I'm not, you know, like a rich, rich guy, right? I'm okay. But I certainly am not like, you know, billionaire in that sense. No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and how do you feel about that? I think maybe I'm old fashioned man. I think I'm lucky. I have not been changed by the discourse. So the language, you know, the popular language in China has not changed me yet. So I think I'm lucky. Mm. Mm. It's wonderful. It, yeah. it's, uh, I, I, I think it's really wonderful. I, I love getting into 
inspect a tense world and see China that way. Um, now, I want to probe a little bit uh, on the Chinese influence side. Um, I know you are <laughs> way better educated because sometimes when I read your Chinese quoting of Chinese poems, I have to look it up in Chinese and say, oh, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> and so tell us, tell us, I heard you were influenced by Bian Zhiling. Yes, right? yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell us about him. Okay. I, I was his student. In person? I, person, yes. Oh, wow. I, I was okay. the first, uh, you know, after the Cultural Revolution, you know, the Chinese university, the entrance examination was restored, right? Mm -hmm. So I was, uh, one of the first students pass the Chinese college entrance examination. And I, I also was one of the first Chinese MA student after the Cultural Revolution. So I became Bian Zling's student in person. I studied with him for three years. Mm -hmm. Uh, last year, I even wrote an article in memory of him in Chinese. So I learned mm. a lot from him, learned a lot from him. Mm. And uh, I, you know, it's under him I started studying T.S. Eliot. Mm. I translate T.S. Eliot mm. into English, including the Wasteland Four Quartets. And this year, I'm, I'm really happy. I did something for Eliot because mm. uh, yes, American publishing house have like, you know, a new collection of Eliot poetry. And they want me to write a preface for this poetry collection, a great. preface from the perspective of a Chinese scholars. Because so many you know, American scholars written, you know, article or press for T.S. Eliot, right? But, but the reason, you know, I thought about T.S. Eliot here is, I think, about the translation of T.S. Eliot, all the poems, all the money I got is about, let me think. Five is 5,000 US dollars, something like that. Maybe 4,000, yeah. So, 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 so. <laughs> So you think this is rich? No, to the Chinese, you know, standard, right? You spend so many years doing all the translation. And you know, like in the wasteland or like Ben Zling's poem, to translate one poem takes so much time. Mm. But I, I, I enjoy doing that, okay? It's labor love, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I don't mm -hmm. want to explain it. No, I really enjoy doing that. But that so, so it, show you how you know the Chinese society changed, right? So, so I uh, want to go back uh, to Ben Jilin's influence on you. Is not only um, he he introduced you to um, T. S. Eliot and you know the the English language poetry world, but also the in a way work ethics the willingness to, to, to labor on something you love for a long time without necessarily counting the pennies or whatever. Um, is that accurate? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Bian mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, he, one thing he told me, I remember repeatedly is like, you have to be able to sit on a cold bench 
otherwise you can never like you know do anything like because you 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 have to be able to to bear you know the to be able you know to stand you know the solitude right because you write a book maybe it takes like several years before the book coming out if you want like you know money you want success instant fame you can never do that mm. so he he really told me a lot and also mm. his poetry really influenced me a lot it's instead of like in you know, the romantic poetry like Sheldon Keats you know Byron no it's it's TSL the modernist poetry mm. What does it, I, I love that saying, you have to be willing to sit on a cold bench. Um, yeah, a all, time, all, yeah. all writers tell me the only thing you need to do is put your butt on the chair. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> um, but in today's society, uh, three weeks, no, four weeks ago, about a, exactly a month ago, landing in Shanghai after quarantine, you feel the busyness, it's the entire society is so busy. What does that do to scholars in China? Are there still room for scholars to, to really sit down a cold bench or, and, but they have to endure more than before because the society would not view them as success uh, or they have to embrace a different way of success in social media or other areas. What what are you observing? I th I think certainly you know, in one sense it can be more difficult for for writers and scholars to do some serious reading or thinking, right? Mm -hmm. Because usually, like you need a long period of time. And this long period, you don't have to worry about anything else, right? You just want to do a project and you have like you know, a good hotel room, like you know, <laughs> in, 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 in the screen, right? And then mm -hmm. you, can, you can concentrate. But nowadays, not too many people can do that. Can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I, I hope. People, you know, even. Like a social media is another example, right? You know, people in China, one thing really struck me at first as about people so working so hard. And everybody has a cell phone in the hand in a subway, right? Everybody. So you say, oh, people are working hard, studying hard. But then another question is when people can have the time to sit down, read in peace and quiet for a couple of hours because the phone is ringing all the time. You know, it's a lot of distractions. A lot of distractions, yeah. 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 To, just to share, I, I hiked from, uh, you know, the smallest town that I drove to. I hiked like 28 kilometers into this mountain area in Yunnan. Uh -huh. And I took a photo of this Mosul lady and I, I wanted to give the photo to her on my phone. And I said, uh -huh. do you have WeChat? She is a Mosul matriarchal society, 76 year old lady. Uh -huh. She fished out her phone and said, yes, I have WeChat. She opened up her WeChat. <laughs> and then while she's doing that, I saw on her phone, she also has TikTok. Oh yeah. <laughs> We are too old fashioned. <laughs> it was quite hilarious. Okay, I'm, I'm conscious that I'm loving this chat, but I'm conscious we're running a little short on time. And the other questions we didn't get to. There's one question here uh, from Mina Zhang uh, says, which book would you recommend to a non-Chinese person when introducing them to Chinese literature? If it's about the book, if you want to read that book in Chinese. No, I think uh, I think it meant in English. Uh, English. In English. Uh, if, if you're talking about like, you know, my books, I would like, you know, recommend the first one. Okay. It's a very beginning of the inspection series. Okay. And also this is a book 
when I wrote, I did not really set out to write an history. So it's, it's really more about Chinese society, you know, more about you know this kind of social background. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if it's a book, like you know, in Chinese, there's a Chinese author I really also want to recommend. It's called Fan Hua, written by <laughs> Jing Yu Chen. Fan Hua, yeah. Many flowers, you know, a lot of flowers, yeah. Fan Hua, written by whom? By a Shanghai writer. His name is Jing Yu Cheng. Jing. Okay. G I N Jing Jing Yu Cheng. It's also a very good book, novel. Okay. I'll look it up. Fantastic. Um, I think there are a few uh, questions in the Q&A box. I'm so sorry, because I'm on the phone, I didn't see them. Uh, if you want to pick them up, uh, okay, so that'd be great. Yeah. OK. OK, I think a couple of questions like, you know, I mentioned earlier, when there's one, when you are, when you write, I think of English or in Chinese and have to translate. Okay. Now for this one, for this one, I, I think I can say at first, I did a try, I did a try to translate you know, in mind. Mm. Like, you know, but then I found, especially when I start writing novel, I can no longer do that. I don't have time, you know, the energy to going back and forth all the time. And another thing I find is very interesting, and it's also something I'm still exploring, is it can be a good sentence, you know, in English. But it may not be a good sentence in Chinese and vice versa. So sometimes you have to really like rewrite instead of like, you know, just translate that. You have to rewrite. And that eventually led my, you know, to sometimes I call it bilingual writing. Especially when I write poetry, it's really short, right? I will write the one version in Chinese and another version in English, and then try you know, to combine, combine the two versions. I do believe each language has its own distinctive sensibility. So maybe it will be a good thing if later on I can combine the different linguistic sensibilities in one mm. text. That's something I think is worth exploring. Okay, mm -hmm. let me let me double check see whether I have some other. I think I think Anthony wants to see the cover of your newest book. A new book, yeah, companion book. Okay, show show us the newest book. Let's see, it's called the Shadow, shadow no. of the Empire. The Shadow of the Empire. Yeah. It's it's about Judge D. It's a Judge D book supposedly written by Inspector Chen. And ah. the Judge D is, you know, the official in the Tang Empire. He had to work, you know, under the Empress, right? So even when he does a case. He had to do the investigation in the shadow of the empire. Mm. So that is why I said earlier, like in the in the, in the afterward, I mentioned it's like you know, China change, and the China may not change. <laughs> it's still you yeah. know the, the shadow is always there. The shadow is always there. The enduring larger community. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, Shalom. This has been such an you know, enjoyable chat. I really loved it. Any of your movies coming out in, uh, or any of your books coming out in movies? Uh, you know, they, they, they did that. 
not the Gazette, like the option of that, they wrote the screenplay, but then you know the relation between the two countries, you now they're changing. <laughs> uh -huh. okay. yeah. A lot of things, it's beyond the mark kind of now, yeah. But okay. all of them made, made it into BBC uh, dramatization. So if you can listen to that, it's Guangbo oh. Yeah, yeah, it's all where, where can Where can we listen to that? It's BBC radio dramatization. You can buy that or like, you know, Amazon. And you can also like, I think YouTube, sometimes you can listen to the free. I don't know when, like, you know, people post okay. it. Yeah, you can listen to that. It's funny to, okay. to, to, to hear like, you know, the English speaking London Cockney accent <laughs> talking Chinese. <laughs> yeah. Now, Xiaolong, we, we uh, thank you so much. We searched for your social media presence, but it doesn't seem like you are very big on social media. How can people follow your upcoming books and news? Uh, yeah, maybe I will need some more help in the future because, you know, it was this kind of things. Right now, I'm too busy writing. <laughs> I, <don't, laughs> I usually like put some Facebook, some news, that's it, yeah. Okay. All yeah. right. Yeah. Well, keep us, keep Wild China informed and we will share any news with our community. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Yeah, yeah, I think we're out of time. And everyone, thank you so much for staying with us tonight. And also thank you for staying with us over the past year or two years. Um, we will have a new book coming, new book to read uh, coming in January and stay in touch. Sign up for newsletter or listen to our podcast. Yeah. Um, or tell us. I'll what send you it like you know, some new review to you. Like, you know, the, this one just got a published week start review. And also, yeah, it got like a really well written review fantastic. from Kirkus review. Maybe some other reviews. I will send that to you. Oh, fantastic. We'll yeah. absolutely share that with, yeah. um, with our community. Yeah. Well, any parting words, Xiaolong? If not, if we any parting words from you to our readers regarding your books or China? Okay. Uh, I wish you, you were traveling in China, right? And I, I am. And I, I uh, wish you like you know enjoy your traveling in China. It's China's really a country. Yeah. Worth traveling, and at the same time. It, in one sense, maybe you should really travel China right now. You never know, like in a couple of years, how that it will be changed. It will be changed. And in the same time, it could be fun if you bring a book to read along you know, the trip, right? Maybe you can yes. find you know, some hotel, some restaurant as mentioned in the books. Yes. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We, will, we hope everyone can come back, visit China soon. Okay, thank okay. you. Happy holidays if I don't see you all. You too. Yeah, happy holidays. Yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Bye, Shalom. Bye, Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.